We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. It says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We live in an age of fear doesn't take very much. Just turn on the TV, and whether it's a pandemic or national discord or some threat of war or terrorism, we live in an age of fear, and media sells fear. I looked at the Johnson City Press one day this week, and there were four stories on the outside cover, every one of them bad. I had to turn all the way to page seven before I found any good news at all. The reality of it is that the media knows that fear sells. Here's the good news for you. Praise God that whatever fearful situation you can face or you're going to face in a constantly changing world, God never changes. We need to fight fear by anchoring our lives in essential truths. And that is our master never changes. Our mission never changes, and our message never changes. We need to do today is we need to proclaim the power of the Holy Spirit to not only deal with the major fears that we have, but also the fears that we have in our own life, in our own psyche of being rejected, of being judged, of failure, and it goes on and on. Fear is such a powerful emotion. There's a huge range of fears that people face as well. I went through a list and I found some fears and phobias this week. See if you can guess what these fears are before I tell you. Nomophobia. That is the fear of losing your cell phone. I know a few teenage girls that actually have that fear. Bogey phobia. That is the fear of the boogeyman. I can't make this up. Lachnophobia. The fear of vegetables. Palatidobia phobia is the fear of bald people. How about this one? Triscodelphophobia. What'd you say? Did someone say it? Fear of the number 13. Yeah. Coprophobia. It's the fear of bathrooms and toilets. How about this one? I think this is the one that every single one of us has from time to time. Phobia, phobia. Simply put, it is the fear of fear itself. We often live a life where we become obsessed with those things which may or may not happen in the future. This is Satan's desire. He knows that he can steal our joy by taking our focus off of Jesus Christ. He can steal our joy to the point that we become obsessed and centered on nothing but our fears. What I read to you this morning, the Apostle Paul Peter was speaking, he was reassuring us here out of the third chapter of 1 Peter. He was telling us there's no need from fear. When we break down those verses, what we see is the text is telling us that our suffering is going to happen. It's inevitable that we're going to find ourselves in situations that are intimidating. But be brave, because we have a solution that is infallible. Now, fear is something that every single one of us has faced. For some of us, we face fear almost every day. Experiencing fear is just a normal part of life. But, and this is the big but I want you to hear, we should not be kept from serving God or fulfilling the purpose that God has given us because of our fears. Scripture teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you want to turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 7. 
It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that, and show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that this life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore, and I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believed and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. That as you get victory over your fears, God receives glory from it. As you look back in that passage in 1 Peter, what you see in verses 13 and 14 is that the suffering that we're going to face is inevitable. It's going to happen. We can take this a step further and say the basic principle is this. The person who suffers trials and persecutions will be blessed by God if, if they remain righteous. How can a person who endures suffering consider themselves to be blessed? Well, there's a danger here. See, the person who places their focus on the things of this world runs the risk of losing everything. The same person can be struck down with disease or suffer a heart attack or have cancer creep into their lives. They could lose all of their possessions. They could have an accident. They could go through bankruptcy. They could lose everything that they're gripping on to so tight. When we, as children of God, put all of our stock in this world, we set ourselves up to live in a life of fear because all that we have is in this life. So when this life is threatened, we can become gripped with fear. And instead of letting God have control, we just tend to grip even tighter. What a sad existence that is. No life, no hope, no future. You end up living a life of constant fear. That something's going to come along. It's going to be this crushing blow. And whether it's family, a title, or position, or a material thing, you just keep your eyes on the horizon constantly for that day to come when you know you're going to find yourself helpless and hopeless in this life. But folks, a child of God is to be different because they're not focused on the things of this world. They're focused on Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, no matter what they fear or suffer, the, the object of this hope does not fade away, nor does it rust, nor will it be eaten by moths. He knows that Christ will take care of him whatever comes. Turn over one chapter, if you're still there in 2 Corinthians, over to chapter Eight of the book of Romans. You're familiar with this, but it's good reading. Scripture says, Romans 8, 28, says it, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is it? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or 
dangerous sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have the victory. A child of God also takes great assurance in knowing this, that God is faithful and he's going to keep every one of his promises. Now, the key to this is giving God complete authority over your life, giving him complete authority over all of your fears, giving him complete authority over all of your struggles. I want to give you just a partial list of promises that we have with Christ. If you're interested, I'll share this list with you after the service. Matthew 6, says this, God will provide us with all the necessities of this life. 1 Peter 4, 4, God will give you his glory in the face of insults. 2 Corinthians 4, 11, the life of Christ is best manifested through us in fear and in suffering. Matthew 5, 11 and 12, God provides great rewards for those who stand in fear and suffering. 2 Timothy 4, 8, God will persevere and take us to heaven as we stand firm against our fears and sufferings. Aren't those wonderful promises? Found directly from God's word. Now, I don't want you to be confused. We were never promised a life free of suffering and persecution when we become a child of God. What scripture does tell us repeatedly over and over again is that when we stand firm and we claim these promises and believe that his word is true, God will bless us. A couple months ago from my MDiv, I read an interesting autobiography. It was about a teacher by the name of Nancy Fye, uh, who was a kindergarten teacher in New York. She got cancer in her sinus cavity and ended up eating away half of her face. In the midst of her suffering in this ordeal, she made four resolutions and faithfully kept them and proclaimed them throughout this book and said that these four resolutions that she made led her to victory, a greater victory than she had ever experienced. I wanted to share those with you this morning. She said this, I will never complain of Christ. Or no, she said, I will never complain. Secondly, she said, I will keep the witness of Christ strong in my life. I will endure. I will share Jesus with the lost. Number three, she said, I will count my blessings every day. And finally, she said, I will recognize my suffering, my illness, and my place in this life and use it to bring glory to God. She had fears, real fears. I can't imagine what she went through. But she turned them over to God. And that's what God can do. That's what God is great at. And it's taking our weaknesses, our affirmities, our shortcomings, and turning them completely around for his glory. That brings me up to my second point. That's found in verse 14 in 1 Peter. It says this, but if you, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. That word phobia is root to a Greek word, which simply means to be alarmed or all or intimidated. And if we allow our fears to run rampant in our lives, they can literally destroy us. How many of you have heard that the word fear or fear not appears 365 times in the Bible? Have you ever heard that before? I actually looked that up because I'd heard that my entire life too, and I wanted to make sure that was a fact. That's not actually true. It appears 366 times in God's word, so there's actually one there for leap year as well. Zig Ziglar said this. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. We often spend a lot of our life worrying about things that very well may never happen, being afraid of things in the dark. I fear most of those things, as Job said, that have not come to pass. 
Now, some fears are very legitimate. I never will forget being 18 years old and having to drive around the Capitol Beltway in D.C. I was scared to death. I still get scared going up there. It's considered the Audubon of the East Coast. People get on there and they go 100 miles an hour and there's not really many cops there to enforce any kind of speed. For some of you, it may be snakes, it might be spiders, it might be some real fear. I, I want to show you. Well, first let me tell you a story. Um, <laughs> Coach Hyder shared this story with me last year about Ella. They said that they were all in the midst, as we're talking about spiders, of playing a ball game, and there was this fairly good-sized spider on the wall in the dugout where they were at, and all the girls were screaming and carrying on. He said Ella came in there, smacked the spider as hard as she could with her hand, and said, okay, can we now play some ball? I mean, we, I'll show you another example. I, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a wolf spider before. Just a huge spider. Beautiful little creatures. They're very friendly. I've seen people actually, now I've never done this, nor do I plan on doing this, but I've actually seen people put their hand out and the spider can actually crawl on your hand and you can take it outside. Most spiders like that, I just completely live, leave alone because I figure that they eat more um, harmful insects. As a matter of fact, they eat other spiders. Um, we found one up at the home. There's a lot of buildings up at the home, as Jason can attest to, that are, that are very old, so we get spiders from time to time. Pretty large ones that you can actually hear kind of scamper across the floor. I found one the other day, like I said, a beautiful one. I came back three days later, and I think I either found him or her. Can we bring that picture up? Now, the spider wolf doesn't bother me. However, when I found her, she had little babies all over her. And ugh, she, all of them were moving. So it looked like the whole spider was moving. Now, the interesting thing about spider wolves is I've been told they can jump two to three feet. And I just sort of envisioned, I just sort of envisioned all these tiny little spiders jumping on me at the same time, going in holes and crooks and places that they shouldn't be going. So, uh, you know, I, I was fearful. There were some real things in our lives. And then there's some made up things. Some made up things that aren't real. I was a very young child in the 1970s. I, I remember, you know, probably in 1970, I was 10 years old. We became obsessed with a lot of things in, in the 1970s, from what I remember. I remember disco was real big. But we also went through a phase in the late 70s where we became obsessed with Bigfoot. I don't know if you remember that phase or not. And as an eight-year-old kid, I just became obsessed with Bigfoot. And this movie came out that was called Sasquatch. It was made like in 1977, 1978. I just bugged my dad over and over again that I wanted to go to this movie. And it was rated G, so they ended up taking me. We went. It was an awful movie. It was just awful. But I never will forget I was scared to death until I was about 13 or 14 years of age of going outside because I was convinced, particularly in the dark, that I was going to turn the corner. I, I know lots of times my dad would take the, have me take the garbage out. We had a shed that was right up against the woods. I was convinced that Bigfoot was going to, was going to jump out and drag me away. Convinced. Real fears, imaginary fears. Here's another fear that I believe for the most part is imaginary. And that is to take into great regard what the world thinks of us as Christians. Psalms 56. Psalms 56 says this. Listen to oh, Psalms 56. Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I'm afraid, I will trust you. In God, whose word I will praise. In God, I trust I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? All day long they twist my words. They are always plotting to harm me. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, eager to take my life. On no account let them escape in your anger, O oh God. Bring down the nations. Record my lament, list my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. 
In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, O God. I will, pres- I will present my thank offering to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. David the psalmist wrote these words about what men can do to us, what men may think about us. We often become fearful if we take a real stand and we become public with the fact that we belong to Christ, that people are going to view us as not normal, that we may run the fear of being misunderstood or or we come off as being self-righteous or an elitist. Every person, after all, has a need to be accepted or fear that they're not going to be. These are the other issues that I think Peter addresses here in 1 Peter. In saying, do not be afraid to be sold out for Christ. Because when you're completely sold out for Christ, it will always be worth the potential risk of you being misunderstood. If you're genuinely going to live a life for Christ, then you're going to face rejection. And you're probably going to face intimidation in a culture that's going to try to tell you there are no more moral absolutes and that your truth is subjective and it doesn't work for them. When you are completely sold out and do not allow your fears to dictate your actions, then you can become the person that God has designed you to be. So finally, what is the antidote for spiritual fear as I close? First of all, in verse 15, we see that we need to have spirit-filled dedication, that we need to set Christ apart as Lord, to see him as the kuri, kurios, as the Greek says, the supreme authority over all, master of all. When we place Christ in that position, we have no need to fear when Christ is in the proper places in our lives. A short time ago, a Gallup poll came out that showed that 78% of Americans expect to go to heaven when they die, but only 26% of them say they ever pray, read the Bible, or attend church. And Christians wonder why the lost are filled with fear. So how do you know if you set Christ apart? Tozer said these people have three distinct marks in their lives. He said, first of all, they only face one direction. Secondly, they never turn their back in the face of fear. And finally, they view God's ways and God's plans as their plans. The second part of the solution, and I'll ask our worship team to come back up at this time, is to be determined to have a scripture-based education in your life. Always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared be prepared to give an account. When my son was born, he was born premature. He actually got below four pounds. Um, When my wife took the epidural, very difficult, very difficult pregnancy, her blood pressure actually dropped to 60 over 40 and her heart rate stopped. That was a very frightening moment for me. Because it was in that moment, it was in that time that I thought I was going to lose everything that I held valuable. Everything that I possessed. But the words from Deuteronomy 31 that we know and the words from Hebrews came back to my mind and promises that God would never leave nor forsake. Those words, those scriptures, those passages can come back to your life as well. And our faith becomes real because we're connected to God's word. Satan is a liar and he's going to attempt to use fear to overwhelm you. A spirit-filled Christian who knows God's word can stand up to the devil. You can put on, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but you can put on, and most of you know it, the full armor of God. So when Satan comes, you can stand up to his threats. 
God is looking and waiting for people to seek Him and to live fearless lives, a life of spirit-filled dedication. A life of spirit-filled dedication is always going to be based on spirit-filled education, turning to and relying on God's Word. We find the answers that we need for in this life by living victory through and in God's Word. I want to read one more passage. And I would if you've not been doing it. Let, let me encourage you as I close this morning. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 6. Scripture says this, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests, blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sound a long blast on the trumpets. Have all the people give a loud shout then the wall of the city will collapse and people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant Lord. I have seven priests. Carry trumpets in front of them and be ordered. And he ordered the people, advance, march around the city. And the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All the time, the trumpets were sounding, and they continued the march. Now, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't probably make sense to you that we would march around seven times and blow trumpets, and walls would fall down, and an enemy would be defeated. That's not something within our own strength. That's not something that we can do. But that's very much who God is. God's ways are not our ways. God's plans are not our plans. God does the extraordinary. Do me a favor right now in this moment. Close your eyes with me. Now I want you to think for just a moment. I don't know what your fear is. I don't know what it is that that one thing that you just can't let go of, that you've got your hands just gripped around so tight. I don't know what that thing is. I don't know if it's your family. I don't know if it's a fear of losing a relationship. I don't know if it's failure because of past failures. I don't know what it is. But I'm sure this morning, if you think, and probably not very long you can think of that one thing. Let me encourage you right now in this moment, that one thing. Because I've found in talking to people, it's typically that one thing that stands between them and God and genuinely going deeper. Take time this moment right now to give that over to God. Let God have it right now. And then trust God to provide for you moving forward. Okay, everyone else can raise your head back up. As you uh, heard just a moment, because of past sermons, I typically always have the worship band come up because they don't ever know what I'm going to lead. So, of course, they're not coming. I did actually have something planned today that I wanted to do with you before we close because we're not sort of doing a time of invitation right now. Can you bring that last slide up? I think it's a shame sometimes that we no longer do what we refer to as a benediction prayer. If everyone will just please stand. And what that is is simply a time where we as people gather and we pray together. And then you are charged and dismissed to go and share the message and to share the gospel and witness. I wanted to do a form of that Today. Now, this benediction is a very simple benediction. It's taken from the book of Romans 8. 
And as a group, before we head out, I wanted us to read that together today. Let's go ahead and I'll start. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people say, Amen.